Hey everybody, I am Joe Tobiasen, Washington State elopement photographer based in Seattle, and today I am here to talk about one of the weirder cameras I own, the Ricoh Auto Half SE2. So yeah, oh, uh, what is this thing? Why do I own it? Well, you know, I got some reasons. I, I, I got reasons, I swear. It's not just owning all the cameras, I'm, I swear. I'm gonna not own all the cameras. I'm not gonna be that guy. I'm just gonna own a lot of the cameras and probably way too many. So when I say Ricoh Auto Half, what the heck is a lot of things? Ricoh is the company auto, meaning automatic, and half, meaning that it is a half frame camera. And then SE2, that's just the model of these. So this particular one, this the, the, the Ricoh Auto Half series was made from 1960 through to the mid 70s. And there's probably a dozen different models within those, all the different features and stuff like that. Um, but let's first, let's talk about half frame cameras themselves and what that entails. So I'm just gonna open this up here so you can see right inside. And a half frame camera is this. It is literally half the size, this opening here, where the light comes in and the light hits the film and it makes a photo, is half the size of a normal 35 millimeter camera. And so with that, hence it is called half frame. That's actually, it's, it's, it's vertically oriented instead of like the normal horizontal that you would see with a normal frame. And this is actually the same size frame that like a 35 millimeter movie would be shot, except those are shot vertically like this. Um, but this is shot like that. Just interesting. Um, these are popularized in that time frame because it was about getting more bang for your buck. People, um, and these are especially popular in Japan in, the, in that, that window. And so people were trying to find ways to, to maximize. And so because it is half the size, you therefore get twice as many photos per roll. I assume that those would then um, get printed on like a normal mat and they just cut them up into smaller photos. Um, I think, and that's, I did some research on like how people get them developed and I honestly couldn't figure that out. So if anybody has like examples of what ordering half frame photos look like in that time frame, like let me know, I'd love to see it. But um, that's just kind of my assumption on how people treated them. That said, these kind of cameras died out in that, that mid seventies range when other small uh, point and shoot cameras started to come onto the market. So something like the Olympus XA or the Rolly 35, because those are, pretty comparable as far as the camera size goes, but the it's a normal size film. And the reality is as much as people like that, it is it is definitely a, a step down in quality to shoot with that hat frame, just because the grain is going to be more pronounced. There's less details in there, especially if you're gonna shoot something faster, like a 400, 800, whatever film, then it's going to be even more noticeable than it would be on a 35 millimeter, like a normal full frame photo. And so, with all those kind of things, it just kind of faded out in popularity. At that time, that's also when film, though still not like the cheapest thing, it was becoming so normal for consumers that it wasn't quite as much of an, it wasn't quite as vital to, to save money in that per frame rate as it had been in previous generations in that early post-war time frame. So with that, there, there are a fair number of half frame cameras out there like I said, because it was such a small window of popularity, there aren't a ton of them. Um, the most popular and most well-known series is the Olympus Pen series. Um, but for me, I bought my half-frame camera because I thought this was going to be the first camera I would give to Lena. Um, I thought that because of the automatic features of it, um, it would be a really awesome first camera for a toddler to do. I thought the half frame would be wonderful because then I would get twice as many photos per roll. And as I know she's going to be a little shutter happy, it would allow for it to kind of not cost me quite as much money. Um, and I, this is not gonna be the camera I will give to my daughter as soon as she's old enough for her first film camera. Um, I'll talk about that why, but it still is pretty cool. So with that, let's talk about the camera itself. The first thing, that's pretty obvious is the size. Like it is really, really small. Um, so this is just like a regular film point and shoot. And you can see here, it's probably about the same width, but it is actually substantially smaller. Um, it is an all metal body as compared to the plastic. So no, it's actually lighter um, than this thing is. So I don't know, it's really light, it's really small. And that was kind of the whole point. Like it was an easy camera to throw in a pocket to throw in a purse, to be whatever, and to go start using. So this camera has a 25 millimeter lens uh, and it shoots at f2.8 as its maximum aperture. So that's about the equivalent to like a 42 millimeter on a full frame camera. So 
pretty normal size, but again, you're only using it in that vertical or it, you think of it natively in its vertical orientation. This particular model is super cool because it also has a hot shoe built onto it. So I can put a flash on there and shoot. Oh, let me do that. It's like I can take like, this is my normal flash for my, that I take to weddings and stuff. And I can put that on there, which I mean, how ridiculous does that look? But it works, like I can totally fire that flash off and it'll take photos along with it, which is pretty fun. This particular model also has a like a, a winder on it so you can do the timer, which is pretty fun. And then it has a, a, a tripod screw here on the side, which is interesting. So if I was gonna be taking photos, I would actually want to figure out how to mount my tripod sideways to be able to get it to its normal vertical orientation. But what is most unique about this camera as compared to any other camera I've ever used is that automatic function and it does automatic things and it doesn't have a battery, which how does that work, right? That's impossible. So the first thing that it does in order to advance the film is that it actually has a winder, like, you know, like an old school, like watch winder. And that's right here on the bottom. I can just twist it. You can hear that it's kind of grinding. It doesn't work without film. So I'm going to load up a roll of film here and then we can see how it all works. So I'd load film in just like so. Open up the back just by flipping the open thing just like you would on just about any other camera. Put the film in and then it just needs to catch into this little guy right there, that little thing. And I can just move it across just like so. I can start to move that across and it should go for just a little bit until it, there you go. Now it starts to catch and it knows it's ready. I can close this here. And now that that's ready, I can start to, to wind. And so you would want to do this for, I don't know, 10 times or so like that. And that should get you about half of a roll before you need to wind it again. Now, personally, I found myself winding all the time. Um, just anytime I kind of finish with a scene, I just give it a once or twice of the wind in there. So now that it's wind, ready to go, all I have to do is just set it up there and that was it. So it's gonna, it just took the photo in there, used the winder system that it did the shutter and then it advanced the film that half frame and it's ready for its next photo, which is pretty rad. The other thing that it does is, cause it is an automatic camera, is that it has a built-in light meter and that's how it knows how to do exposures. Now, the thing about this camera is that it doesn't have a focus at all. Like you might, I, you, you can't focus this camera, which is cool and cool and annoying. Um, it is the way that the lens, like the way that the math works on this is that this one, when shot at f2.8, anything from one and a half meters away from you to infinity should be in focus. And if you're then, if you're gonna shoot at an even smaller aperture, it should be even more than that. And so personally, I find myself actually using like faster films, like 400 or something like that, just to be able to make sure that it's as much as possible, this camera is shooting those small apertures because since I can't focus it, I can't create any sort of a depth of field. So I might as well just embrace the fact that I want it all to be in focus and have as small of an aperture as the camera thinks it can be. It basically operates like it's in shutter priority all the time. So it takes photos at 1 25th of a second, unless I change the setting that I'll talk about here in a second, but 1 25th. And then the, the light meter is reading and adjusting the aperture to, to fit the scene. And that aperture is being set here by the seleniums here on these little bumps, like a very rudimentary solar panel. And that's what it's using then to, to be the guide of how much that, that aperture needs to be open in order to have a correct exposure. So that comes to this little knob here. This is about the only settings you can change in the camera. Um, if you do want to set the, when you're, when you're loading the film, you need to set the ISO here by just simply moving this inner knob back and around. So I just put it to 200 film. So I'm going to put it just like a third of a stop under 200. So that'd be like 160th, I think. Um, just that it would help to, to make sure that those shadows are fully exposed in there. And that's the only, that's the only ISO, or ISO settings. And then you can see on the out here, this outer knob, that it can be adjusted just like so. It has A for automatic, and then it has all of the other apertures. So like I said, when it's on A, it's gonna take photos in one, one twenty-fifth of a second. So this is when the camera is expecting to be shooting outdoors, and it is going to adjust the aperture accordingly so that you have the correct exposure. So if it's really bright, it's going to stop itself down 
and shoot closer to that f22. If it's twilight, it's gonna shoot closer to that wide open at f2.8. But if you adjust it yourself in here to those other ones, what you're doing is the concept is that camera is like, oh, so you must be inside and you're gonna use a flash. So that's when I would want to have a flash on here. I would mount it on there. When you change it to that setting, the camera actually shoots at one one thirtieth of a second. Now, obviously I could not have the camera, the flash on here, and I could shoot it at a thirtieth with whatever aperture I choose in there, which you definitely can make that choice if you want to. Um, personally, I just like one of the reasons I wanted this camera was that it would be easy. So I'm not going to try to overcomplicate this thing because like there's no meter readings on this. Like I can't hold this up to my eye and have the camera tell me what I think it, what it thinks it should be. It's just going to either do it for me or let me do it for it. You'll also see over here that on one side you have the, those, those F stop numbers and then it over on the opposite, it has a corresponding distance as far as the flash goes. So I'm not going to get too deeply into flash math here, but basically it's saying that when you're shooting closer to wide open, it's basically the bigger the aperture, the more the flash is going to read. The smaller aperture, the less the flash is going to hit. And so by, if you're having f 2.8, it means that the flash is going to flash out like six meters. So what is that? Six, 18, 20 feet or so. And you'll be able to hit the flash to there, to that point, assuming that your flash is consistent through all these. Whereas if you want to photograph something that's a lot closer, let's say something that's only a meter away, you'd stop it down to f 22. So you'd have less, ap less of an aperture hole same flash, less light, hit the thing that's a lot closer to it. I hope that makes sense. All right, so that was, that got, that got real nerdy real fast. Sorry to anybody who got lost along the way. Um, but how about using it? Like I, like I said, mostly I've been using this camera with either 200 or 400 speed film in it, just because I do want it to be a little bit on the faster to be able to lean more towards using those smaller apertures and have everything be in, be in focus. And so I did a couple of test rolls and then I took it to Palm Springs, which was a really awesome place to be using a camera like this because I, I just enjoyed like the, the fact that everything was gonna be in focus and I could just, focus in on textures and composition and framing and making interesting photos. And in using the camera itself, I actually, I really love shooting with a vertical orientation. I really love using it because it is so small and easy to use. Like I've, aside from that trip to Palm Springs like a year ago or whatever, uh, I've taken it skiing, which was awesome because I was able to just put it in the Napoleon pocket of my jacket and it worked. I mean, this all metal, it's built, built like a tank um, camera. Like it was a really cool day that I was skiing and I was able to pull this thing out and take photos without any problems. My iPhone was in the opposite pocket and it got frozen out and like died on that day. <laughs> I had to like wait for it for hours for it to, to warm up and to be able to use it again. But this old thing that's like 60 years old, just able to take photos the whole day along, which was really kind of fun to see. My only gripe about using that, especially on such a cool day is that you do have to, this, the shutter button is really long. And so you, when you're taking photos, you really have to push it all the way in. And when your fingers are really cold, it's hard to register when that's gonna happen. And there definitely are a few times I feel like my composition and especially like my horizon lines weren't perfectly on because I thought like I'd get it framed up just like so. And then I'd push it and then have to push it just a little bit more. And in that like little extra push, like the camera tilts just a touch. And so photos are a little bit off kilter, which isn't a huge deal normally because you could just, just crop it. But the thing about the way that half frames work, especially in the modern era, and this is really kind of the biggest feature for them is that it's the accidental diptychs. So you're gonna see why that was a problem here as I explain what I mean by an accidental diptych here. When you shoot one of these cameras and you, you send the, the photos off to the lab to get scanned, most modern scanners are only gonna be looking at them in the normal 35 millimeter size, not the two of them in there. And so what happens is that when you get your scans back, natively, they'll usually, they'll come to you with the two photos right next to each other. Now, you can definitely ask your scanner to crop for you and to, to split those, but this is the way that it's just gonna come to you automatically. And it, that can be really fun. Like I've had a lot of photos that I've come back and I put them next to each other. I was like, whoa, those two photos just like work together. And it can really open up your eyes to, to, to storytelling and to doing things to show the photos, to show the space in, cause you're literally using two photos to tell the story instead of just one. And there are a lot of times that I go out and 
I, when I'm taking photos with this camera, I'm out there and I'm trying to think in pairs. And so I go and take a photo here and then that of these two things that work together and will work to tell the same story. Or even if it's just like visual textures or whatever, trying to find things that if I know that one is going to be like bottom left, the other will be upper right, or that the, the, the lines might, might mix or something like that. And trying to bring those things together so that they work together. Now that says what I said about off kilter horizon lines, that's where the problem comes in because if photo one is perfectly vertical and photo two is off kilter like this, you can't really put those together unless you like do it intentionally, but like just like little mistakes become really glaring mistakes when they're put right next to each other like that. But personally, as I am somebody who does all of my own developing and my own scanning, uh, it does mean that I can kind of work on my diptychs myself and figure out which ones are, how to make those diptychs better, how to tell the stories better, and then also find which photos just are kind of standalones. And my best trick with this is to scan a whole roll at once. So I use an Epson V600 uh, scanner to scan my film. And when I scan it in, if I was to take a roll of these, I would be able to take 12 photos from this, put it onto one side of the Epson and put them in there. And the, the, the scanning program would space that out into six individual photos of two. What I like to do is rather than that, is to take that entire side of all 12 images and scan those in as a one big DNG file. Then I do a quick conversion in Negative Lab Pro just to see what it all looks like positively. Then I'll go back and I'll make virtual copies of just the pairings that I like. And so sometimes I'll even use the same photo twice, like once with its photo to the left and once with its photo to the right to help make sure that the photos match and to help tell those stories better. And it's really helpful because there are a lot of times when you're getting it done automatically that you might have taken photos like one and two together. But if let's say for some reason, your numbers got off or, you know, as much as you're trying to follow like the number reader on the bottom of the camera, you got, you know, you just got your numbers off that it could throw that, that, that pairing off. And so this by helps it expand to looking at 12 photos at a time. It allows me to pick out the pairs that work the best. Then also once it's paired down into those, then I can redo do my work through Negative Lab Pro and re-edit it in a way that really brings out the contrast and tells that photo as well as possible. A lot of times I end up cropping it down to being just one photo, editing that, closing Negative Lab Pro, and then scan, opening the, the crop back up to both photos. Um, just because then it's it's not dealing with that black bar, which can be kind of tricky to deal with. Um, one thing I wish it, once you're all done and it's time to rewind, there's just one little tidbit here. So you've been winding all along here doing this kind of thing. Uh, you need to push this button on the bottom and that will release any of the spring. So it's been wound and it's kind of like prepared to keep taking notice. You need to release that beforehand. And then you would just take this little orange thing and put it to the rewind position and then you can take it out and rewind the film. Now that's just like, it took me a while to figure that out. So I hope that that settles and solves any problems for you. So what's my final opinion on this camera? I, I think I like it. Um, I didn't spend enough on it that it really feels like it's really worth to sell on, but I also don't love it. I, I, I thought that I would really love the automatic features of it and then how little I have to think about it, which is really handy, but I'm not gonna go hand this to a toddler for one particular reason, and that is that, that fixed focal distance of one and a half meters and beyond. And that's because a toddler would be taking photos of things that are about a meter and a half away from her all the time. I have let her take a couple photos of me over the years. You can see these ones here just from test rolls when I first got the camera and I'm out of focus. And even now, like I still take photos of things that I think are gonna be in focus or close that I like it's bright enough that the aperture is gonna be shut down enough that it's gonna be in focus and they're not. And I don't know, that defeats the purpose of like the whole reason I bought this camera was to be a gift for, to her and it just can't be. So we'll keep looking for the perfect toddler camera. Um, and also, I don't know, maybe it's just my model. I find that it's just not quite sharp enough most of the time. Like the lens is, it's good, it's fine. Like the newer versions of these that were made in the mid seventies had like a 1.7 lens, so a little bit wider. And I think those had a little bit of more focusing. So maybe that lens would be different or something, but it's just like, most of the time I look at these photos and like, eh, they're cool, but just, just not quite there yet. But I love the concept of the half frame. It's like, I'm still open to looking for one and we'll probably try something else. But I just don't know if this particular one is the one for me in the future. 
So with that, if you've ever shot one of these or another half frame camera, let me know your experience in it, especially if you can help other people really enjoy the fun of this sort of weird and almost forgotten part of photography history. Um, let me know so we can all have a lot of fun with that. Have a good one.